Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is how to fuel an atomic bomb. We're beginning our unit on how to construct nuclear weapons. And as we're going through these lectures, I want you to keep something in mind. None of what I am describing is a secret. How to build nuclear weapons is actually relatively well known. It just so happens that each of the steps involved in the process is fairly difficult. And that is what creates both cost and logistical barriers to the construction of nuclear weapons. Now to the actual fuel. There are lots of elements out there, but it turns out we really only care about two of them for the purposes of creating a nuclear weapon. Those are uranium, way down at the bottom at number 92, and plutonium, number 94. Those are the two things that you can use to fuel nuclear weapons. But regardless of whether you are going with a uranium route or a plutonium route, it all starts with acquiring uranium. You need uranium to start either of these processes. Where do you get uranium from? Well, obviously, a uranium mine. This is what a uranium mine looks like. It's a bunch of rocks. Uranium is different than an element like gold, where you can actually find large chunks of gold sitting in the ground. With uranium, it's mixed in with rocks. So when you're mining uranium, you're essentially taking large chunks of rocks, which has some portion of uranium mixed in with it. And you have to process it to be able to acquire just uranium and not uranium mixed with rocks. So how do you do that? Well, you mill the rocks down and then treat them with a solution. And after you've done that, you're left with something known as yellow cake. This is more and more concentrated uranium, and it gets its name because it actually looks like cake that's yellow. You may have heard of yellow cake before. It's infamous for coming up in the 2003 U.S. State of the Union address. During this speech, President Bush accuses Saddam Hussein of trying to acquire yellow cake from Niger. We now know in retrospect that the intelligence that this was based off of was faulty. Saddam Hussein wasn't actually trying to do that. But I want you to keep this in mind where Saddam Hussein allegedly was in the process of trying to fuel a nuclear weapon, as not only we're going through this lecture, but the other lectures that discuss how to build and deliver a nuclear weapon. The takeaway here is that yellow cake is a preliminary step, and there's still a lot more to do before you can actually have a nuclear weapon. What's next? Well, as I mentioned before, naturally occurring uranium is not suitable for the construction of a nuclear weapon. That's because the vast majority of it is this non-fissile uranium-238, which I'm representing in blue. It's only that very small sliver up top, less than 1%, that is uranium-235, the isotope that is fissile. So you need to enrich this to be able to go anywhere. If you enrich it a little bit, less than 5%, then you have low enriched uranium, which is suitable for nuclear power plants. If you enrich it a little bit more, you still have low enriched uranium, but up to about 19.75%, you have uranium that is suitable for research reactors. If you do a lot more enrichment and you get a much, much larger concentration of uranium-235, then you have high enriched uranium, which is suitable for weapons. Getting from naturally occurring uranium to highly enriched uranium is not a simple process. In fact, we don't have a chemical way of separating uranium-238 from uranium-235. The only thing that we can do to figure out how to separate it is to exploit that slight weight differential. Uranium-238 has three more neutrons than uranium-235, and as a consequence, it is slightly heavier. So we can do something to abuse that fact. We start by converting yellow cake into uranium hexafluoride. That is one atom of uranium and six atoms of fluorine. Unlike yellow cake, uranium hexafluoride is a gas. That makes it easier to move around. And we take that gas and we put it into a centrifuge. This is what one of those centrifuges looks like. And it's operating like any other centrifuge would. 
you're feeding in this uranium hexafluoride, which is a mixture of uranium-238 and uranium-235. You're turning on the centrifuge, so you're spinning it very, very, very fast. And what that is slowly starting to do is move that heavier uranium-238 to the outside and the lighter uranium-235 to the inside. And the more and more you do it, the more and more concentration of the fissile material you'll have internally. This process tends to be fairly slow, but there is something that you can do to accelerate it. Namely, you get a cascade of centrifuges all lined up. This, in fact, is an example of a cascade centrifuge in Iran. So at the start of the centrifuge cascade, you have this naturally occurring distribution of uranium being pumped in. And you have that centrifuge spinning around, and it's going to make the concentration of uranium-235 in the center go up. So you have that centrifuge pump out that enriched uranium to the next centrifuge down the line. It's going to spin a lot as well, and inside of that you're going to have even more highly concentrated uranium-235 in the center, and you're going to have basically back to normal uranium distribution on the outside. So you take what is on the outside and you feed it back into the first centrifuge, and you take what is inside and you move it along to the third centrifuge. So every centrifuge down the line within this cascade is going to have ever-growing higher concentrations of uranium-235 until eventually, if you do this enough and you have enough energy spent on spinning these things round and round all day and all night long, you get up to enriched uranium, whether it be low enriched for the purposes of using it in a power plant or a research reactor, or high enriched for the purposes of creating a nuclear weapon. Then you take that gas of highly enriched uranium and make it back into a metal. This is the type of thing that would appear in a nuclear weapon, and we'll talk about how those things are actually assembled in the next lecture. Recapping option one now. You enrich uranium, separating uranium-235 from uranium-238. This has a bunch of different steps. First, you're mining the rocks. Then you're milling those rocks. Then you're turning that milled uranium into uranium hexafluoride gas. Then you're spinning that gas around in a centrifuge to exploit the slight weight difference and ideally putting it in a centrifuge cascade so you can do that separation process a little bit more efficiently. And then once you're all done, you're converting it back to a metal. That is the uranium option. The second option still requires obtaining uranium, but what you do after that is very different. Rather than enriching the uranium, you take unenriched uranium and run it through particular types of research reactors or power reactors. When uranium-238, that very common uranium isotope, absorbs a neutron, it turns into plutonium-239, plutonium being that other element that we had described up top. Like uranium-235, plutonium-239 is a fissile isotope. And you can take the spent uranium that has come out of the research or power reactor and run it through a reprocessing plant. That reprocessing plant will extract this plutonium-239 and now you have a fissile material. Reprocessing is not done physically. It's done chemically. So if you're having a hard time going through that uranium enrichment process, going with plutonium offers you a different solution toward the development of nuclear weapons. And in fact, that's what we've seen with North Korea. This is the Yongbyon nuclear reprocessing facility within North Korea. North Korea was having a very hard time enriching uranium, and so they instead went with the plutonium route. And those are the two ways of trying to develop nuclear fuel. Now that you know that, the next thing we can talk about in the next lecture is how to construct a nuclear chain reaction and put it into a bomb and have it create a large explosion. Hope you enjoyed this, and hope to see you next time. Take care.